all had at some point lost uh, someone to medical errors. The movie industry uh, lost one of their greatest uh, director, Abbas Kiarostami, that uh, I was raised by his amazing movies during, uh, during the last 20, 30 years, and we lost him quite young to medical errors. On the other side, many of us have seen fruit of excellence medicine, excellence medical practice. I personally tried, you know, experienced it. My dad had in 86 a bypass, then an aortic stent in 98, a carotid artery repair in 2008, and pacemaker in 2012. So basically, uh, science and medicine and good performances extended his life and his blessing to us and to his big family for over 25 years. Surgical performance affects our life uh, and the lives of our you know, loved one. But what is this performance? How can we improve this performance? So basically, this performance is complicated. I mean, I usually tell to my students, you know, uh, a surgeon who cuts well and sutures well is not really the definition of surgery. You don't need 30 years of acquiring knowledge and education and many years of hands-on experience to cut and suture. The performance is about information, analysis of that information, making decisions, and then doing the action. And this is, in surgery, this is a very dynamic process. Now, about 100 years ago, or about 120 years ago, doctors had no imaging. So what would, how do they, how did they decide about their patient? So as we say, well, I don't know, the engineers, they would look at patients as a black box, like a device that you get. So the only way they could analyze that was to looking at all the input output. So that's where they could look, what is the input output of this system, look through this input output, eventually make observation of that, uh, that black box that they wanted to know what's going wrong inside it, taking, looking at the symptoms, measuring signals coming from that closed system, eventually taking some samples, blood sample, urine, or saliva, or maybe going more invasively, doing a biopsy and trying to get samples of this system. In the, you know, in the extreme case, even open the patient to see what's wrong, which was happening in end of 19th century. In the last century, thanks to a lot of development in imaging, starting from Röntgen, uh, Hansfield, all the way to Mansfield, we went from not having imaging to have X-ray, CT, ultrasound, MR, PET, PET, CT. So we started to have a lot of imaging, a lot of information, and also to have computational power to visualize that. However, the majority of this information was mostly displayed on, you know, on monitors and displays. So the best nuclear medicine experts, radiologists, or even surgeons, they were looking at this display to analyze this data and make their mental model of what's going wrong. In, inside the surgery room, this was even more complicated because they had to interact with this data. And if the data is far away on a screen, even interacting with it becomes very complex. So about 10 years ago, we took our team with our head-mounted display and with our surgical partners, and we went to Berlin in an orthopedic conference, and we showed to hundreds of surgeons that they, in fact, thanks to this augmented reality or medical augmented reality, they could see the CT data, the data of the patient, directly on top of the anatomy. They could take a wireless mouse, interact with that data, instead of seeing an X-ray shot or a CT on a screen, they could actually directly see it on the patient and analyze it directly on the patient. They could, they could have volume rendering tanks. They, they were very, very excited. We, we wanted to bring this 
farther to bring it into procedures, into surgeries. So how do we bring this augmented reality into the operating room? The first augmented reality system we went, which went on many, many operating rooms was thanks to a startup company of two of my PhD students uh, and the surgical company, which allowed many uh, processes such as sentinel leaf node biopsies to be able to see actually the nodules in augmented reality and also in virtual reality. But why did we need this virtual reality window on the side? Because the augmented reality was very nice, was showing them where these nodules are, but to get a 3D distance, 3D perception, doing interaction with that data, they still needed this additional virtual reality display. The reason is augmented reality is not only about 3D image overlay. 3D image overlay is a very, very little part of the augmented reality. If we want to be augmented humans, we want to see beyond the wavelengths that our eyes can see. We want to hear beyond the frequencies that our system can absorb or analyze. But still, you know, if I take the X-ray, if I take the CT, still I have to bring it to this limited bandwidth that humans can see. And this transfer is not easy. If I only augment the 3D, even in the stereo, on top of the feet, you see it floating. Your brain says, this is floating. This is not integrated. So what we now, at that point, try to do is to use human perception and the cues we are using every day to actually fool the system and improve our perception, to, to use the human cues of perception and make the human believe that the human is really seeing 3D inside that patient. So now, this little tricks of computational science and mathematics, the same data, now you feel much more integrated. As you are looking, we are using a few cues. One of them is parallax, when I move, I see more. I can see different positions. I can see more information. That allows me to believe that that anatomy is behind the surface. But I still keep the ghost of the high curvature information on the surface. Because if I remove that, I lose the shape of the, of the anatomy. We also use the fact that if I look directly into the window, I have to see through it. If I look on the side, I see less. So we start to go, you know, instead of looking at the cadaver and superimpose the CT that I see completely floating, we can go to a more complex visualization. This is the same CT data that now we are looking through with the cues of perception of human, and now you start getting confused. What is real? What is virtual? Because now we are using, if you see the lines on the surface are continuing, while you feel that you are seeing inside the anatomy. How could we enforce this coexistence of real and virtual? So how can I work with real tools in a virtual environment and cannot you know, go towards a direction where I cannot perceive them or separate them from each other? So this is Felix, one of our master's students a few years ago working with Christopher, uh, Christoph uh, Bischelmeier. He is looking with a tool. And now what you see here is the shadow of the tool is falling both on real and virtual. So as he's moving, this shadow doesn't exist. This is a virtual shadow. But you see it both in real and virtual. So your brain starts to feel that all this belongs to one environment. So your brain starts to put everything into one shape. Now, if I have augmentation, how do I explore the 3D? Usually, when you have a 3D data, you move it around and get all kinds of perception about full 3D shape of the object you have in front of you. Now, if I am in an augmented reality situation, 
when I have the patient in front, of, in front of me, and I see the anatomy of the patient, I can't ask the doctor, if I move it, I lose the alignment. And of course, I can't ask the surgeon to go under the table to see the underside. So we got inspired, but what dentists do, we took a virtual handheld tangible mirror and we brought it inside this augmented reality view. Which means now I can have my augmentation, but I can create any impossible view and therefore I can interact with that data. So now I have an augmentation, but I can look at any view I am interested inside that patient. Now, one of the challenging points, real challenging point, when you want to bring the solution, such complex solution inside the operating room, is how to in integrate it into the workflow and how to make sure that you are showing the relevance information. If I show everything superimposed, it may not be useful. You have to show the relevance information at the right time. So, Many years ago, we developed this uh, system where the X-ray system and the camera system were attached thanks to mirror system. X-ray and optics always had the same view. So the advantage was that when we were going to the surgery, and actually we went to 40 trauma surgery in the center of the Munich, thanks to incredible surgeons too, so you could you could position the patient for the first time. You could take an X-ray, stop the X-ray. I want to use minimum X-ray. So you take one X-ray, you stop it, and now you can start working under the optic, but you can see through the patient. And about 40 patients used, for 40 patients this system was used quite successfully. Now, this is nice. I see the X-ray, I see my hand, I can go through it and I can reduce the number of x-ray from 40 to about two or three and improve the surgery. But now the question is that this augmented reality scene is very crowded. So we started to bring in machine learning. How does machine learning play a role here? We have to learn, we have to understand what the doctor needs to see at each moment from each modality. If I have X-ray optics in this case, or if I have PET, CT, MR, etc., during the surgery, the surgeon needs to see the relevant information only. So what we started was a very simple machine learning system. We tell the system that I want to com combine X-ray and optics, but I want you, the system, to automatically re recognize which element is in the scene in optics and x-ray view, and to automatically decide how the blending should happen to give me the optimized view. So instead of what we were showing on the left-hand side, now the system automatically shows what is on the right-hand side. So it says, if I have a knife, I want to see it. I don't want the x-ray on my visualization on my hand. I am interested in the X-ray of internal anatomy, but I don't want it to reduce my performance by making it overloaded. So now at each pixel of the optics and X-ray, the system is deciding automatically what that pixel information is and how it should be merged into virtual and real. The last part is how to create this for the next generation, how to prepare the next generation. You know, we have this acceptance issue, but we also, now we want this to come to our everyday life. So we started to work on augmented reality also for education and for patient and public information for the last few years. And actually I brought a system here that after my talk, you can try it so basically, the system allows you to, to get in front of the system, and then the system sees through you. So uh, basically, the system is going to recognize me, and then it starts to augment my body. So with the left hand, I can show different parts of anatomy and focus on different anatomy of my body. 
With the right hand, I can increase the amount of information, go from simple bones to vasculatures to arteries and vein to internal anatomy and finally to muscles. And then I can see the system with, and then I can analyze it. We brought this to many places, to many schools. You can turn it off if you want. It was very intuitive. So we brought it to Essen and about 2,000 people played with the system. They were children, they were adult, and all of them right away started to play around with their own body, look at different parts of their body, play and try to understand what's going on. And the simple was so simple, the system was so easy to handle that not only ch children and adult, but also politicians could work with it. So you can imagine that the system was extremely simple. Now, the, the main idea, the main message I have here uh, is if we go for, uh, you know, in the last century, imaging come in and radiation therapy departments, nuclear medicine department, radiology departments, they had to bring physicists into their departments to help them take advantage of radiation therapy, take advantage of, uh, you know, PET, MR, CT, et cetera. And our generation, our community, our society now needs to have computational scientists at the heart of hospital. It's not acceptable that we can, on my mobile phone, we can get all the information that we need in a matter at our fingertip, and our surgeon, the surgeon who is doing the surgery on us, cannot get the information needs to improve his performance right in front of him. Thank you.